Hi, Mark. Hi, Lisa. How are you? I am good. How are things with Grace? They are good. Aw. Got through shop. We got through. Everybody's done with finals finally this today. So we're going to go shopping tonight. Finally nice. Through. Yeah, like we can do some Christmas stuff now. That's wonderful, wonderful. Yeah. Well, hey, do you think you can make me co-host and I will start sharing my video and we'll wait for Joe and Duncan to come? Are we recording all of these over to Royal Circuits or Advanced? I don't, they're just going to advance. They're just, I don't know. I should do, <laughs> I need to do both. I'll do both. Let me go look at our YouTube channels. It's just a dance assembly at this point. Okay. No, that's actually what I wanted. So that's good. Okay. I am the host now. You are and YouTube live has started. Okay. So you said we've got, we're up to 180 registrations. Yeah, it was like 185, I think. Nice. Last time I checked. That's good. Yep. So what do you think is different about this? Um, well, we sent out an email blast to both databases, um, separate invitation. And so oh, hang on, you can't read, that's weird. And um we also put it out on LinkedIn. So, I mean, it's a significant increase in response rate, it seems. Yeah. We did just an email that was just about this only. Two. All right. Well, we'll have to keep all that in mind for the next one. That's good. Although I think this is the last one I have scheduled for um, Teach Me PCB because we're kind of going into a hiatus while everybody orders boards. Okay. And I think next week is, you know, Christmas Eve and whatnot. Yep. So. Cool. Well, I'm glad you got Grace home. Yeah, it's nice. Nice to all be together. Finally. Kind of hard to hear you. Is your mic down? How's that? Is that better? That is better. Yeah. Just have to look at the computer. So, and then we got the IPC project rolling, I think. Yeah. I sit. Yeah, I saw that. I emailed Shane and asked him to step in, but I haven't heard from him today. Okay. We're all working from home today. Uh, we'll be back in the office tomorrow. Really, all we need at this time is a B number. Hey, let me know when you get your ornaments. I'm curious okay. how fast they are going to be delivered. All right. Well, there was nothing in my UPS notifier for the mail today, um, ornament wise, but I'll definitely keep you in the loop. I still haven't received the last batch. They'll go out tomorrow. So that's pushing it by Christmas, but well, fingers crossed. Yeah. And then I did have an idea for if we ever do go back to um, trade shows for a giveaway. Oh, good. I'm always looking for ideas. All right. So one of the problems that you have when you're doing um, PCB design is sometimes you need traces to cross over. And typically the way you do that is with a via in the board. Yep. But what if we created a small little PCB that you could solder on top of two pads that did the crossover on top so that you'd have more routing space? Wow. So the giveaway would be a ruler that would be skip scored that people could break apart and it would have a bunch of these little boards that they could use in their designs. Wow. I love that idea. That so, is a great idea. It would not be hard or expensive, but super useful. Yep. And, 
you know, depending on how big we make these, we could logo every single one of them. So there are names on everything. That's a great idea. So, yeah. And it, uh, easy peasy, lemon squeezy. So. I'll have what? to edit the beginning of this webinar so people don't listen and use our, your idea. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, I don't know if we have anybody listening yet. Not yet. We're good, but we're not that good, right? <laughs> Let's see. Um, says one watching. So whoever you are, if you steal our idea, put our logo on it. That's all I'm saying. It might be me. It, yeah, it could be. So Lisa. Yes. If you still are right. No. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> How's Caroline? She's good. Really good. She, she out of school now or tomorrow? Yep. Today was last day of finals. Yay. Yeah. Good. That'll be good. Yeah. Kids need a break, man. They are so busy these days. I know. It's true. Well, I wonder where our gentlemen are. Let me check my mail to make sure they're not having issues. I did resend it earlier today. Yeah, I got mine. Um, hmm. Okay, I'll just shoot them an email. Would be not great if we have to reschedule. What's that? That wouldn't be great if we have to reschedule. Oh, no, we won't. I've had like three or four back and forth with them today. Oh, okay. So I, oh yeah, I forgot to tell you. Sorry, I had to run out to the drugstore. So, yeah, and I'm, I'm not worried about that. I just want to make sure they're not having issues getting logged in. Who knows? Could be restarting their computers, doing final edits. They were even asking me for more graphics, you know, as early as an hour ago. So. Oh, great. Yeah. And they did the Hackaday Hack Chat yesterday. Okay. So did they mention this one? During that or not? I did. Oh, you did. Okay. Oh, there they <laughs> there's, are. There's Duncan. Yeah, I snuck in there and harassed him a little. Hey, Mark. Hey, Duncan. How are you? Pretty good. How are you? Good. We're also on with uh, my boss, Lisa, the director of marketing for Advanced Assembly and Rail Circuit Solutions. Hi, Duncan. Hi. <clears throat> Thank you for doing this with us. Of course. We're excited. No, we are excited. You guys are our most popular uh, content. <laughs> We're still amazed at how many views that one video has. <laughs> well, you know, we promoted this um, and our, our viewer count like quadrupled um, compared to the last two webinars we've done. Mm -hmm. So it's something people are really interested in. Awesome. Yeah. I mean, no pressure, no pressure. <laughs> <laughs> well, in like a typical, uh, why do we push an update this morning mode? We uh, broke the 3D render. <laughs> <laughs> website, so That's the way it goes, man. <laughs> yeah, but add a little bit more content to the presentation and we still have a little bit of a demo to show, so. Oh, cool. All right. Uh, do you want me to interact or stay out of the way? What would you prefer after I do the introductions and everything? Um, definitely feel free to interact. Um, I really liked last time how you kind of like prompted me with questions. Um, okay. Well, I will try to do a even balance of letting you do your thing and harassing you. <laughs> Perfect. Nice job on the, hatch, the hack chat yesterday. Yeah, thanks. That was fun. I wasn't really sure what the hack chat was until... Um, that's pretty cool. I think I'll check them out more often. Yeah, they've got some interesting stuff. Dan had some openings, and I'm like, hey, I know who to fill. So, 
yeah, no, that was really interesting. Is Joe coming to? Oh, there's Joe. We need to make him probably co-host too, I assume. Yeah, I think so. May co-host. Yes. All right. We got three hosts. We're rocking. Hey. Beautiful. How you doing, man? I'm doing all right. How about yourself, Mark? Good. Good. I'm really glad you guys joined us today. Um, as I was telling Duncan, um, you're popular. <laughs> cool. Why do you say that? Because like compared to the last two webinars, we had, I don't know the exact number as Lisa does, but it's like four times as many people sign up for this one. Oh, really? Wow. Yeah. Okay. So specific to the sign up list then. Yeah. Um, cool. And then also on our advanced assembly, other than the ads we run, you were number one. Our last one we did. Yeah. I'm sorry. Like the video. Yeah. 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 We've been definitely keeping an eye on the YouTube views. So. So, yeah, it's very cool. Mm -hmm. Sorry, I'm playing with the Zoom settings right now. Sure. We're about two and a half minutes out. Cool. This is also live streaming on our YouTube channel right now. Perfect. So how's business been while you're getting that loaded? Um, good. We're getting busy. <laughs> so always a good thing. That's good. I saw last year you hired somebody. Yeah. So um, what? There's four of us full time now. Um, we have a, a full time test engineer who lives in Arizona who's helping us, and then a software developer in the Philippines who's us on the website nice that's wonderful guys i'm excited thank you yeah. and, uh, we have opened up a small workshop in seattle so we have like our cnc mills and everything there now for building the fixtures and yeah we're, we're growing oh i wish i was in seattle to come see it i love that kind of stuff <laughs> it's it's sweet <laughs> it's a little like two bay garage no lease it's perfect for us <laughs> <laughs> all right um do you want to make that full screen and we'll go in and get started. Yep. I'll do an introduction and then hand off to uh, you two. Um, will you be sharing these slides at the end? Uh, yeah, I'll uh, download this and uh, send it to you. Okay, so I'm going to start letting people in. Feel free to continue to banter, um, but they can start joining right now and it'll start populating. How many people have been joining for each of these webinars? Uh, well, registered for you guys, we've, we're expecting about a 180 um, to join us, and then there'll be more on the live stream. So um, it, some decent numbers. It's a good number. Um, yeah, it, like it's, it's, it's pretty high. Um, and then you get the views after the fact too, right? People will rewatch this after YouTube processes it and, and uploads it. So uh, just in the time I was talking, we're up 50. So great. Yeah. All right. It's time to get started. Welcome, everyone. My name's Mark Hughes, and I'm here on behalf of Royal Circuit Solutions and Advanced Assembly. And I am excited because today we've got the most popular people we have ever had join us. Mr. Joe Selvick and Duncan Lauder, the founders of Fixture Fab. These guys know everything there is to know about test fixtures, uh, PCB test and automation. Great all around guys. And we're, we're, we're really glad to have them. So before I introduce them and give them, you know, pass things over, I do want to let you know that we will record this webinar and have the slides available at our website, aapcb.com com forward slash blog and at our YouTube channel. With that, Joe and Duncan, welcome, gentlemen. It's great to have you. Tell us a little bit about yourselves. 
Yeah, thanks for having us, Mark. Um, so Joe and I, uh, we're the founders of Fixture Fab, and uh, we provide uh, PCBA functional testing solutions um, for many customers. And we can help with anything from just uh, kind of machining a fixture that you've designed yourselves through uh, designing the complete system and writing the automated test software uh, for testing the device that you're uh, manufacturing. Yeah, and I'm Joe Selbert, co-founder of Fixture Fab, and I work on all of the above that Duncan just mentioned. <laughs> yeah, um, yeah. So today we're going to kind of go over like uh, our approach to uh, PCBA functional test fixtures and kind of dive into the details of um, why we do things a little bit differently than what's commonly seen in industry, and kind of work through an example project um, based off of a macro pad. Um, on like what would we actually want to test on that circuit board, as well as uh, how do we go about designing the mechanics and choosing the instrumentation for actually performing that test. Okay, and just to be clear, you're not going to judge the macro pad too harshly, right? <laughs> no, no judgment on the macro pad at all. <laughs> okay, because the reason we made this wasn't for test. It was, it was basically so that we had something to start a course with. <laughs> <laughs> and it, it does a great job. There's test points everywhere on it and they're huge. <laughs> yeah. And a lot of them aren't even connected to anything. <laughs> <laughs> even better. <laughs> All right. Well, let's hit it. Yeah. Um, so I'll start off with, with uh, just kind of going over the typical uh, manufacturing process for a printed circuit board assembly. Um, so it's kind of split into three different sections. Um, after the uh, circuit board is fabricated, um, which is a whole nother process that I won't touch on, um, it then goes into assembly. And this is where uh, solder paste will be applied to all of the pads for the components. The components will be placed using a pick and place machine. And then it will be soldered by uh, running it through a reflow oven. Um, once the board has been through reflow, all of the components will be soldered onto it. Um, and after that, it can then be run through some automated inspection uh, steps. Uh, the first area is an opt automated optical inspection where um, a tester with a bunch of cameras will take images of the board and uh, kind of use computer vision to identify any defects. So if a resistor was tombstoned and um, didn't get soldered across correctly, or if a component actually didn't get populated or fell off uh, before it was reflowed. And then um, in some cases, you also do automated x-ray inspection. Um, particularly if you have any uh, BGA components or any hidden pads on any of your uh, footprints, you'll wanna run it through X-ray to make sure that uh, solder connections were actually made there. Um, after running through the inspection steps, uh, you will then move into kind of the testing phase. Um, this typically consists of both in-circuit testing, uh, which can be done either using a flying probe fixture or a uh, dedicated ICT fixture, and then functional testing, um, which will use a bed of nails fixture to uh, power the board up and make sure everything uh, functions correctly. Um, what we specialize in at Fixture Fab is more of the uh, functional testing side of these things. And so uh, we're looking at you know, programming processors and making sure um, they can talk to all the other ICs on the board, et cetera. Um, so what does a functional test actually do? Um, what we're looking at with this kind of testing is to make sure that the, uh, every kind of like sub circuit on that board functions correctly. Um, so in the case of this uh, Arduino board from a spark fun, we wanna make sure that the processor can run, that we can program it. Um, it brings up, it's not held and reset, um, et cetera. Um, this has a USB to serial chip on it. So we wanna make sure we can connect to that uh, using a USB port. So the device enumerates can, and can be detected by the test system. And then we can actually communicate with the processor that it's connected to. And that will completely validate that, you know, the uh, USB to serial communications is working. And then uh, one of the main things you wanna do before you even get to either of those steps is to double check that all of your voltages are correct, that all your voltage regulators are working and um, can power the board correctly. So for something like that, about how many test points do you think you would need to, to get all of that stuff done that you were just talking about? Yeah, uh, so this, um, you'll want a ground test point for sure, um, and then a test point on every voltage rail. Uh, so, you know, two or three on this one. And then uh, to program the board, that can be as few as three pins. Uh, 
and as many as 20 or 22 uh, for programming the processor and then for uh, doing serial comms, you know, USB will need D plus, D minus, and ground, and then for serial RX and TX. So to test this entire board, we would be looking at probably like 10-ish uh, test points. Uh, sorry, you're muted. Yeah, thank you so much. Um, I, I appreciate that. And also to let you know, we're getting some audio quality issues on your end, Duncan. So check the quality of your internet connection. File a complaint with the state. Write a letter to the governor. But thank you for answering the question. Thank you. Yeah, um, definitely let me know if I, I continue to have audio issues. Oh, we will, Duncan. <laughs> we will. Um, so why do you actually want to do this uh, functional testing? Um, the main reason is you want to identify defects on the board as early during manufacturing as you can, since it's much cheaper to fix it earlier. Um, I always use the cell phone as an example where uh, they're glued together. So if you have an issue with the circuit board that goes inside of it, and you don't test that until the entire phone is glued apart, you then have to unglue it, take it apart, find out what's wrong on the circuit board, fix it, and then reassemble the entire phone. That's a pretty timely and expensive process. Whereas if you can identify that issue before that board has been assembled into the phone, like as soon as it's been soldered, it's much faster to actually do that rework and much cheaper to fix that problem um, than farther down the line. Um, so to actually do this functional testing, um, the traditional approach is, or uh, it, it covers all different segments of engineering. Um, you need to design a mechanical fixture that will uh, precisely locate the board you're testing and then uh, position the test probes where all the test points are. Um, you then need to do a bunch of electrical engineering to design how all the uh, instrumentation, like the multimeters and oscilloscopes that you're going to use for testing the device, how those interface with the actual test probes. And uh, this gets even more complicated if you uh, need to test like high speed signals or something like that where you need to be really careful about what you're actually introducing into the system. Um, and then last component is the software engineering, because you need to develop a automated test uh, plan or test software that will run through all the tests so that an operator doesn't have to sit there on the factory floor manually checking voltages or looking at readings. All right, we are still experiencing some intermittent audio issues, Duncan. Uh, could we have Joe take a couple slides and see if you can troubleshoot that for a minute? Yeah. Cool, thank you. Haha, ha, Joe, I made you work. <laughs> yeah, I'm here. I'm just pulling up the slides on my end right now. Um, can you hear me fine right now? Yeah, your audio is good. Uh, Duncan, it sounds like it might be a buffering issue, like bad Wi-Fi. Great. So we just ended going, kind of going over those three pillars, kind of, of what it takes to make a fully automated test fixture solution, where fixture fab works specialist in that mechanical design. But then on top of that, you need to integrate and select what kind of like test instrumentation goes into this uh, test fixture. And then once you kind of know like all of the various devices that you need to read the various inputs and outputs, then you need to orchestrate it all together with that automated test software. Um, so kind of like the standard approach of like what we see like a lot of our customers working on these days is usually national instrument solutions, which is gonna be test stand and lab view. And there you're kind of using these uh, national instruments chassis with their various uh, PXI cards. And this is what you will use. Like these are the devices that read the various voltages and currents and nets. Um, and then you use LabVIEW to program all of that. So the way Fixture Fab likes to do this is very similar where you have the mechanical fixture and then underneath it, the test instrumentation, we use a system from a company called Acronym that's located in Boulder. Oh. Do we lose the presentation? Hmm. Can you still hear me talking? I cannot hear Yes. You. Yeah, you're good. I think Duncan rejoined us and that affected Zoom. But yeah, we're golden. Keep rolling, sir. All right. I'm sorry. Am I, am I giving the presentation? No, I think Duncan is right now. No, buddy, you're, you're still on. Uh, maybe we can try Duncan again at the next slide. Let's see here. Or Duncan. Duncan can go, and we can try you again at the next slide. 
I've also got a cat <laughs> here that is yeah. very vocal. He'd be happy to present. Yeah. All right. Um, okay, let, let's try. Uh, so Joe, did you cover this slide? Uh, yes, but I realized I was clicking and the slides are not proceeding. So I think we should start right here at the standard approach. <laughs> okay. So the standard approach um, for these test fixtures is to uh, manually wire them up, uh, typically using wire up to the test probe receptacle. And then you have a long wire that will then connect to um, a interface connector or something or the instrumentation uh, that will be used. Um, a lot of people use kind of like a PXI chassis with a bunch of national instruments devices in there. Um, it's a great way to test almost anything you want, but it can get costly pretty quickly. And then uh, the most common test software I've seen at factories is typically uh, LabVIEW and Test Stand. So um, they'll actually create their automated uh, test software using LabVIEW and Test Stand uh, depl to deploy at the factory. Do you have a ballpark for how much all that costs? Um, the I've only designed one PXI chassis system, and it was about fifteen thousand dollars per tester. So pricey. Wow. Um, and then a lot software. more expensive than putting a Raspberry Pi in it, right? <laughs> so. Wow, that's a lot. Yeah, that's. It looks like it's a car. It's it costs a car. Yep. Yeah, and especially when you pile on like the uh, licensing fees for LabVIEW as well, like it can get pricey. Wow. All right. Yeah. By so, the way, um, audio uh, primo. <laughs> and I just jinxed it. Yeah, we froze Duncan <laughs> just with that comment. <laughs> um, so kind of the approach from fixture, uh, uh, what we do is we use Ingen uh, test fixture bases. So Ingen's a German uh, fixture supplier and test probe uh, manufacturer. And uh, we really like their uh, fixtures. They're a little bit more costly than some other approaches, but they're great. They're bulletproof. Um, and then instead of manually wiring to the test uh, probe receptacles inside of the fixtures, we actually design a custom uh, PCB that we call a test point carrier board. And this will then solder to those receptacles and interface them to the instrumentation used to take measurements. Um, we use acronym modules. Uh, they're a instrumentation company in uh, Boulder, Colorado. And uh, they're kind of ruggedized Arduinos is the best way I have of describing them where um, you can buy modules for either analog inputs or digital IO. Um, they have like switchable USB hubs and uh, programmable power supplies. And it allows you to kind of do continuity testing or measure voltages, talk over I2C. Um, and it's much cheaper than building out an entire uh, PXI chassis or something like that. And then for the test software, uh, we've moved to using Python for everything. So we've built a um, kind of module for the uh, PyTest um, Python module. And so we actually uh, create PyTest uh, scripts for all of our functional tests. And then we have a GUI that they can run in. Um, almost any instrumentation you can uh, buy, you can talk to using Python and like PyVisa or a couple other modules. So we found it to be a great way to quickly get up and running and um, it's free. Like you don't have to pay for any licensing fees or any distribution fees if you're using Python. So let's get into kind of like the nitty gritty of like how these fixtures are actually put together. Um, so at the very um, basic level, you have test points on your circuit boards and you want to connect to them. Um, you Nails fixture. To do this, you use a pogo pen, which has a, a spring loaded tip that will meet with those uh, test points to make an electrical connection. Um, these pogo, pogo pens are then inserted into a receptacle, um, which is mounted onto our test point carrier board or mounted inside of the fixture. And uh, the reason we use these receptacles is it allows you to actually replace the pogo pens as they break or wear out uh, during manufacturing. Um, Duncan, you know, when you're testing millions of units or, yeah. Your audio, buddy. Oh, man. It's bad. You might have to take over. <laughs> it sounds like you're going through a, it sounds like you're going through a tunnel, like all the time. Uh, Joe, could we have you talk and we'll let Duncan run the slide deck? Um, yeah, we can try and okay. do that. All right, I'll pay attention to the Zoom this time and not the PowerPoint. <laughs> all right. So um, right here, I think we're just going over the, how you have to select your pogo pins for your test pads. 
And then there's kind of a choice you have to make where various probes have different tip styles. And selecting the tip styles is actually a very easy way to kind of like improve the reliability of that mechanical test fixture. So a lot of times, if it's just a, a basic SMD pad, like we're showing there, you can just pull out, select that spear tip. But then if you're trying to probe a through hole instead, like you see along like the upper and bottom rows of the image right now, you might be able to pick like a crown tip. Or if you're trying to probe a component pin, uh, you might want to select a tip that looks like a cup. That way it can kind of wrap around and make a little bit more surface area connection with that signal. Um, if you go on to the next slide there. Yep, so why a big reason why we really like the Ingen system for mechanical fixture bases is kind of because of this modular system that they've designed. Where on the left, you have a standardized fixture base, where in the middle, you might want to stick your instrumentation and computer to run the tests, but then the actual custom part for each device under test is that cartridge that slides in and out of that base. So you are able to basically design different cartridges for various board layouts and swap them in and out with the same fixture base. And this helps a lot. Like a lot of times in manufacturing, you might have a respin of the board that might change some of those physical locations. Um, so then this kind of modular approach really helps like future-proof that test system. Um, we'll kind of like, walk, if you actually go back one more slide, kind of like walk through the different layers in there. So at the top, you have the pressure plate, then you have a moving plate, and then a probe plate. So we have some images later on this, but basically that pressure plate is what comes down and it's vertically actuated. So it directly pushes that device down flat against that moving plate. And this helps prevent warping in that device under test. So as you push it down on top of 10 to maybe 100 different test probes, it really helps to not damage that board as it lowers it down into that probe plate where all those probes are mounted. And each one of those pins, I mean, even though they're small, they're still like one or two Newtons of force, right? Yeah, I believe they're specced for one Newton per pin for force. So yeah, if you've got a hundred pins, that's a hundred Newtons. Yeah, um, it adds up quickly. Yeah, what? that's like 25 pounds. I don't remember the conversions, yeah. but it's a lot. Exactly. And then we, for our production systems, we'll actually run some like finite uh, unit analysis, like make sure you're not warping or bending the board too much. But really it's that moving plate that helps like provide the extra support for as it's being pushed down upon all those spring loaded pins. So right here is an image of inside one of our fixture bases. And this is what's underneath that probe and moving plate. So we like to use Intel Nooks for a lot of our systems because they're pretty uniform, um, small form factor, and they're affordable. And here we'll install Windows or Linux, depending on what our customer wants. And this is the actual computer that you plug your keyboard and mouse and monitor into. So you can execute those functional test suites that you write. And then kind of also in there is a USB hub and your standard power supplies to make sure that everything is powered up and running correctly underneath there. Okay, and what was that little computer called again? It was an Intel Nook, or Intel, Intel Nook. Yeah, um, just a small form cap, form factor PC. Um, they're around, I don't know, 150 to 200 dollars, depending on what specs you get. But we it, we like use them for all of our projects, just because we're used to unboxing, boxing them, programming them, whatever we want. Um, but specifically, they are a nice compact form factor that comes at an affordable price. Got it. Okay. Cool. Yeah, so here we have a closer look at that custom cartridge that was on the right hand of that side of that one slide. And kind of in the middle, it all starts with that pro plate, which is that teal thicker color plate. And this is the first piece that will actually CNC machine. So you can insert all of your probes. So they fit, what goes inside is first the receptacle. So you, which is kind of like a metal sheath that you insert each probe into. And then on the bottom, is where that test point carrier board uh, receives each of those receptacles and routes those signals to the various instrumentation. Down there in the bottom left, you can kind of see that white uh, card right there. That's one of the acronym modules. So each of the pinouts on that PCIe slot are being routed to the various receptacles that it needs to know to contact that device under test. 
And then if you kind of start moving back up that image again, you'll see that thinner black moving plate. And that's what I was trying to describe. This is where that device under test sits flush upon. So as it's being pushed down upon those, that looks like maybe 50 probes in this example, um, it really helps like distribute that force that's being pushed down from those pressure pins that are coming from above. So how do you, I, I guess my question is, so you, you've got the PC, do the pins go down from the, or the, the carriers go down from the top and then the board comes up from the bottom to get soldered, to solder the pins on? How do you, I guess what I'm asking is how do you move the force onto that green plate and off of that PCB at the bottom? Yeah, so at the very top of this image, there's gonna be some pressure pins coming down that you actually can't see in this picture, but they're gonna be pushing down on that device under test, which is gonna be flush against that moving plate. And then you can kind of see some of those springs that were right there. And those straight springs compress as it moves down on top of those spring-loaded probes. Um, and here's, a, here's a live example. Um, yeah, right here's a live example where we have each layer of inside that cartridge. On the right is just that probe plate with all the spring-loaded pins like mounted securely into it. And then on top of each of those, we'll have those cutouts in that moving plate. Um, yeah, so we'll have those cutouts in the moving plate. So you can kind of just see in that middle image, the tips of each of those probes are lined up. So it provides that flat area for that device under test to be pushed down upon. And each of those uh, probes are lined up to contact the device, the test points underneath that device under test. As an engineer, how do I know how closely I can put pins, you know, and how many pins I can put closely before I start, you know, frac you know, bending my board and fracturing components off it? Yeah, so this is actually where fixture guide will come in. We have some design for test guidelines and following a few simple rules will like drastically improve like the reliability of, and testability of your circuit boards. So there's kind of like a standard sizing for these various test pins kind of starts at 50 mils, 75 mils, and 100 mils. And this is that pitch, basically, that minimum distance from the center of a test pad to the next nearest component or test pad. So if you're measuring that distance from the middle of one of your test pads, it can be no smaller than 50 mils, or I think it's 1.29 millimeters apart to the next test point. Um, and then there's a few other rules that you kind of want to keep an eye out too. It's kind of like the distance from your test pads to the nearest component. Because a lot of times those components, they have their own like profile that might have like a larger unit on top. They have to be aware of for when you're placing your pressure pins and guide pins to make sure that they don't collide with each other. By so, the way, I feel bad that we've kind of kicked Duncan off the stream. Duncan, <laughs> if you can hear us, we love you. Oh, looks like Mark just got muted too. I just got muted too. Yeah, they they mute me all the time, man. I just unmute myself. It's cool. Yeah, it um, happens to the best of us. Yeah. But yeah, Duncan, if you want to try talking, uh, we had a commenter say that with the video off, it might be enough bandwidth to have quality audio. <laughs> let's let's see if it works. <laughs> um, can you guys hear me? Yeah, but I can still hear clicks. Did you hear that too, Joe? Um, it sounded okay to me. Oh, well, now we're going to have there mommy you. and oh, daddy are going to fight. Okay. Let's see. <laughs> oh, yeah, give it a shot. Let's try a slide, man. Let's, let's get you back in here. Okay. Um, yeah, so after, like, uh, the probe plate will hold, you know, the probes just as Joe was saying. And then um, here's kind of an another view of a test point carrier board. Um, <laughs> this one we had quite a few mess ups on, so you can see the botch wires everywhere. <laughs> Um, but this, like, a, we will automatically place the test points in the right locations and then kind of route the signals to the various instrumentation um, that's needed to uh, test the board. Um, and then here's a look at the uh, kind of pressure plates and how um, the circuit boards are actually held against the uh, test probes. Um, so this plastic plate will be machined, and then uh, these kind of valves are a place so that they'll push down on the board that's being tested and provide even pressure across the surface of the PCB uh, just to ensure that there's no bowing of uh, the 
circuit board here uh, testing. Duncan, unfortunately, your audio is still not good, buddy. I'm sorry. Yeah, yeah we're good. Yeah. Hey, um, so Joe, we've got a question coming in. Um, yeah. Everything that we're seeing here is pushing down from one side. What happens if an engineer decides to put test points on, say, both sides of their board? You know, let's say they're not a very good engineer like me, and, and they put them on the wrong side. <laughs> what does that yeah. do to cost? So it increases it, Mark, is what it does to cost. And that's because you need to then implement dual-sided probing. So we've been talking a lot about kind of the mechanical design of these test fixtures. And then when you introduce the second layer, so now you need to align those spear um, probe tips to both ends of the device. All of a sudden you need to also customize that top pressure plate and find a way to route those signals back down to the fixture base. Because now you're trying to just like, trying to probe both sides of the board mechanically. It's a lot more complicated now. And it is possible to do. A lot of our production fixtures will actually support this, but it just increases the complexity of both mechanical design and then it needs to be a more robust fixture to make sure that everything lines up nicely. I think you got muted again, Mark. Okay, there we go. I'm unmuted. Right. Boy, I mean, audio today, it's getting us, isn't it, man? It's yeah. getting us. We're yeah, this yeah, technology. Yeah. You know what we really need is a test fixture for Zoom. <laughs> Make me one of those. <laughs> they might have software I, test fixtures, but that's a whole different can of words. Um, so I think the reason that we lost the screen was we lost Duncan entirely. He must be having some serious internet connectivity issues. And um, are you able to bring give a, me the capability to share my screen? You should have it already. Let's see. Uh, you are co-host. Down at the bottom, there's a green share screen with yep. an arrow. All right. Um, and then what we will do for participants, um, if, if uh, again, depending on your schedule, Joe and Duncan's, is um, I would be more than happy to re-record this webinar with you guys. We'll figure out the audio and then we'll post that. Yeah. We should so you good. don't have me sitting there slapping you both around about audio and presentations. Uh -huh. <laughs> Let me see here. There it is. You got it, man. Beautiful. And then um, what we'll do is, since Christmas is coming up, we'll both be sure to take Duncan off our Christmas list for having bad Wi-Fi. I mean, I have to have standards in my friends. Mm -hmm. You do too. No, right. It happens. It happens. So we can definitely walk through and finish this presentation quickly before we want to go and record it. But are you able to see just my screen right now with the presentation? Yeah, well, yeah, no, no, no. Don't don't go through it quickly. Don't don't do any of that. Um, I'm just saying for our participants, we'll either have Duncan re-record his part or, um, you know, we can all jump on whatever you want to do. Or I can voice over. I, I love doing voice over. Yeah. This is how I think Duncan sounds. Yeah. Mm -hmm. No, right. I, I don't think nothing will want that. Okay, so we just had the question of what do you do when you probe both sides and increases the cost considerably? It does, yes. Okay, and then we've also got um, questions uh, from Benjamin. It looked like long wire wrap style connections to the pogo pins. How do you make connections that require high speed and high integrity? So if you've got, say, an RF or a diff pair, that would be the first question. Yep. So first you had to identify what signals are going to be basically those RF signals. And then, so you'll saw with those acronym cards that go into that test point carrier board, it is actually pretty um, reasonable to place that PCIe connector close to those signals. Of course, it's not always an ideal solution, but you would definitely want to use um, a test point carrier board in case when RF is involved. Okay, and then the next one we have is, do you have recommendations about distributing test points on a given pitch? Should they be clustered, inline, spread out, or random? Um, so basically you wanna make sure they're as spread out as possible. That is the ideal solution. But as long as you're following those minimum pitch requirements, 75 is kind of like considered the, what we prefer for like the minimum spacing, but you can go down to 50. Anything below 50, um, you're going to run into a lot of repeatability and intermittent reliability issues. Um, but beyond that, there's not that much of a difference if they're all in a line or spread out randomly throughout the board. 
So on a 70, so 75 mil on center spacing for uh, just another word for pitch, what diameter test pin would you use for 75 or maybe even a 50? I believe the minimum diameter of the test pad we support is one millimeter or maybe 0.8 millimeters. But any, it kind of depends on the tip style that you want to use that's going to contact that test point. Yeah, I, my concern was, you know, when you're down that small, even having the probes slightly misaligned, I, I'm sure you could get shorts and all sorts of stuff. Yes, exactly. Um, and that's what you're trying to avoid then with larger pads and better spacing between your test points. All right. All right. So kind of moving on here, I think Duncan was describing as in this slide, this is a picture of that last plate, that pressure plate. And this is where you see these rods are placed. So they push down on that device under test that pushes it into that moving plate. And then you kind of select the location for these pressure pins by looking at your device under test and selecting a bare spot on the board. So that pressure pin is not pushing down at any of the components. Okay. So that's just something else you have to keep in mind as a designer. That sounds like a lot to keep in mind. Yeah. The mechanical design work does add up between just understanding the mechanics, uh, electrical integration, and then like how to orchestrate and automate the entire test system. And then everybody wants everything so flipping small these days, right? You know, you get a, a board that barely has room enough to sit the components on. And now you've got to design this other stuff. And yeah, I got to tell you. Or, or then they throw in flex boards too. And you have to figure out how to like reliably place that. How do you do that? Um, a combination of various solutions. You can 3D print mounts that hold it in place or little clips that clap it down onto that moving plate. That would be a good thing to add to this presentation for next time. Or you can also provide cutouts that are maybe like a slight like millimeter, two millimeter like indent that follows the outline of that flex board. Wow. Yeah, man. Um, and then we've got another couple of questions here if you're up for them. Of course. Um, how are, how are you locating the board for test? How do you ensure the board is correctly positioned and aligned to the test pins? So ideally you wanna, uh, this, we can use this board for an example right here. You can see in the corners, there's these tooling holes or um, mechanical holes. You can actually place dowel pins um, to basically, if you have three of them, it's pretty easy to locate the board. Um, and then if you do not have tooling holes in your circuit board, you can line dowel pins along the border of that device under test. Um, but if that's not an ideal solution, we'll go as far as 3D printing a cradle that your circuit board will fit into. What, okay, so um, let's say I've got a three millimeter dowel pin. I would assume that's relatively standard. Yeah. Um, what kind of diameter hole do I want in my, um, in my board? Like 3.05 millimeter? Yeah, what? I think 3.05 is what I was about to say. Okay. Yeah, and in so, reality, sometimes you can even like shave down the dowel pins a little so it fits inside like a standard um, diameter. Okay, um, and then another question came in, if you don't mind. It says, do you add physical components like thermal contamination, shock, and vibration tests to your processes? You definitely can do that in test fixtures, but that is not what Fixture Bab, uh specifically specializes in. But we'll talk with customers fairly often. And they'll ask if you want to like stick this inside of a thermal oven, maybe. Or um, yeah, there is there's you can go deep down the rabbit hole of like types of testing yeah, or a salt there. spray booth or whatever. Yeah, yeah. Just be nice and keep the keep the good electronics away from the bad electronics, and then you're gonna get salt and electronics. Yeah, exactly. Cool. Okay, we're. We're caught up on questions, man. Let's keep rolling. All right. Having fun. This is exciting. Yeah. So we kind of jumped ahead here, but this kind of goes back to like the fixture fab. So uh, approach for when we're designing our turnkey automated test systems, where we design that customized mechanical ingon fixture base, and then we'll select the test instrumentation. Ours is heavily focused on the acronym MTM manufacturing test module system, specifically because they have a Python interface. But they can also interface with C, C++, and LabVIEW if you want to go that route too. And then this is an example, um, very high-level example of our test runner, Al GUI. 
So the way we write to, like to write our functional tests is very similar to software unit testing, where you can just, when you run your unit tests against your device under test, you'll see a simple pass fail for each test case. And Duncan, I believe was getting into that earlier in this presentation, we're kind of going through like the high level like tests that you want to run when designing this. Let me see if there's a slot. I think later there's an example of a test specification that we used. Um, so kind of we're going to take a step back then and how Fixture Fab approaches like designing all this. On the right here, you'll see some screenshots of our design software where we actually uploaded the, the board, the brain board uh, for this project. And here you can see we're able to detect the location of these large test points that were on the top layer of this board. And what you are seeing here then is if you're hovering over in the actual software, you'll see the name test probe type we have for each test point. And then to make sure that it lines up, we were able to get this render by uploading the Gerbers into our design software. And then these uh, circles with like the light shading around it, these are the locations where these pressure pins are coming down to push this board against that moving plate to make sure they're kind of like, we just um, eyeballed this one when designing it, but this would make, make sure there's like roughly uniform pressure and pushing this board down into those test probes. This uh, board wasn't specifically designed for test. Um, the, the little circles are, are supposed to be nodules for like brain synapses. Mm -hmm. I mean, it was designed I would, for art. Yeah, I mean, it looks really nice, but also like you'll notice that the desk points are very well spaced and there's plenty of room there for that probe to make contact with it. A lot of times if the diameter of your test probe is like even just slightly larger than the pad itself, you might run into like reliability issues with reading that signal. Got it. Interesting. And we would much rather that? see large test points like this than smaller ones. So why do you get that reliability issue? Um, so just when the tolerances are that small, maybe between like a 0.7 millimeter diameter pad and like a 0.8 millimeter diameter probe tip, it needs to line up perfectly. Otherwise, that contact between the conducting and non-conducting materials just isn't going to be reliable. All right. Very cool. And I think I can zoom in a little bit on a couple of these test points you're talking about. So I'm over in the corner of the screen, but you can see these things, these big circles all over the place. Uh, and those are the test points that he's talking about. Yes. So there's you know, more than are needed on this board just because I was using them for art. Yeah. And that's okay too. Um, so yeah, kind of like going through the files that we use to like get, generate these renders in our software are typically a test point list, which is where you'll go through and it's just a CSV of the each net you want to probe and the coordinates of that test point. And then we recently added the ability to parse a Gerber file. So you're able to visualize where these test probes are going. That's pretty cool. Yes. And then in the bottom here, you'll we'll see an actual 3D render of the fixture itself. And kind of like the more fancy stuff that why Fixture Fab is a startup then is we realized designing a test fixture, in the end, it's just precisely placing a bunch of holes in a plate. And then if you're making a lower end development fixture or a higher end production fixture, it's just a difference of like what materials you're machining it in at that point. Um, so very it's very, cool. Yeah, so once you know the locations and how to model everything, it's pretty easy to switch the locations of those between um, fixture types. What's the maximum number of pins you ever see on a board or test points? I'm sorry. So for a single device, it's uncommon to have more than 100. And every once in a while, when someone asks us, we would like to probe 128 test points. We'll ask them, do you really want to access the 128 different nets? And we can always drill as many holes as you want for test probes, but in many cases, the customer might, might end up only using a portion of those nets and test points. But then you might run into, if you want a panel of devices to test in your fixture. So if you want to test six boards at once, each with 50 probes in it, all of a sudden you have to worry about the force of 300 pre, um, pins. Right, so it might be better to depanelize and go individual. Exactly. Uh, yeah, it's always a trade-off between how fast you want your cycle time and what your manufacturing volumes are. 
What is the cycle time on, say, a 50? I guess it would depend on which tests you're running. But on your typical board, what is the cycle time for one of these? Uh, yeah, I mean, that's totally dependent on the functional test that you want to run against your board. If your pretty common thing is just like run voltage, short circuit tests, flash some test firmware, and run like a simple functional test suite. I don't know, depending on how long it takes to program the board with the test software and then flash it again with the production software, maybe 60 seconds. But then if you're stepping more into like hardware and the loop testing or like burn in tests or stress testing, sometimes you might want to like leave the fixture closed for like several days on end to like see how it holds up over the course of a few days. But yeah. that depends once again on defining what you want in your functional test specification. Interesting. So for like the 60 second, um, trial time. Do you guys have any way to put this into a production line? Like, can I put a stack of boards somewhere and let it chew through? Or is that on your roadmap? In, can you repeat the question? You're saying like in an automated solution or? Yeah. Yeah. So like, let's say I've got a thousand boards and I don't want to pay an operator to stand there for yeah. a thousand minutes. Do you are, do you have now, or is it on your roadmap where I can just, you know, drop the boards and something, let them go over, get tested, good, bad. So Ingen does salute, uh, support fixtures for that. Fixture Fab has not yet done this. But every once in a while, we'll talk about like using a robotic arm to load the devices. Um, but that is further down the road than Fixture Fab is targeting right now. Fair enough. Yeah. I, the only reason I asked was I thought I saw that mentioned in the hack chat yesterday. <laughs> yes, someone was asking about that in the hack chat yesterday. Typically, we mostly see um, our customers having an operator already on the line, and they want someone there to scan the barcodes to get into the fixture and close it and run the tests. Got it. Yes. All right. So I, I really appreciate that you guys did this brain board from Teach Me PCB. That is cool, man. I like that. It's a good looking board. It, is it looks like the Teach board. Me PCB logo. Yes. <laughs> Let me see here. Just refreshing myself on what we put into this presentation. So yeah, here, just gonna run through the rest of the slides before we wrap this up though. But here's an actual test specification that we have written before. This, I think we gen, uh, made this more generic. But you'll kind of see like the hierarchy of tests that you usually wanna run when testing a circuit board. So you kind of wanna start with your short circuit tests to make sure because if the board's shorting, you can't go much further than that. But then you're gonna check all your voltage rails, make sure that you're measuring the correct values there. And then you're getting more into the functional testing of this board, which is when you're programming the ICU on your circuit board. A lot of times there might be a specific version of the firmware that you want to test with it. And then you can start jumping into testing like the peripherals and LEDs and analog input and output pins that that ICU is using on your circuit board. And then kind of you get more specific as you work your way through test specification from here. So if I wanted to commission fixture fab to do what you just did there, right? Do the, exactly what we see there. Um, about what, what amount of turnaround time does it take you guys? For a full mechanical test fixture plus instrumentation plus software? Yes, yeah, so for this board, what I'm seeing here, uh, would this be like a uh, couple months to figure out or? We, so for our fully automated production test fixtures, we try to turn these around in four in six to eight weeks, I think is our target right now. That a lot of that lead time is just waiting for the parts because everyone knows the supply chain is kind of a disaster right now. Um, but beyond that, like we can finish a mechanical design in several hours at this point. And then it's a matter of labor and bandwidth of actually fabricating the plates, cutting them out, assembling the fixture. But then you can also start developing these tests alongside of that too. All right. So it sounds like the, the bottleneck though is part availability. That is a big bottleneck that we are working through right now. Yes. I think we're all working through that right now. I think everyone is working through that right now. Yes. So, but otherwise it sounds like it doesn't take you all that long. Especially the more you do this over and over again, a lot of times like cir circuit board testing comes down to like kind of this like basic buckets of functional testing. And a lot of times you don't realize that if you're only doing this like for every product that you work on, maybe one to three years, depending on that product development life cycle. 
but you definitely start seeing some patterns as you start developing functional tests, like on a day-to-day -day basis for various circuit boards. So this would be something that would be fun to outsource. Yes. And if you're interested in this kind of work, you should definitely contact us too, because we're slowly building our network of people. We have outsourced some of our software testing before when we don't have the bandwidth. Oh, wow. That is cool. So for engineers out there, um, we do have a question here. Yes. If you want to test a switch like shown here in section five, does a robot actuate it? If you're testing an LED, is a human or machine detector or are you measuring current? How do you test some of these things? Yeah, those are great questions. I'll start with the LEDs because that's actually a very common thing that people ask us, how do you test LEDs? Our preferred solution is just electrically reading the signals on the inputs and outputs of that diode. But sometimes it matters like for the color and brightness and intensity, we could actually integrate an LED um, optical analyzer. Hmm. Um, and that's kind of comes into, it's basically these small fiber optic cables that you have to like line up in front of the LED mechanically. But that, once again, is more expensive, requires more instrumentation, more delicate mechanical design. So electrical testing of LEDs is good for 90% of the use cases that we see, unless it's like a super important LED that needs to be the exact hue that they're looking for. And what about switches? Do you have linear actuators or pneumatics that you integrate? So once again, testing the signals on the switch is always the preferred solution, it's the simplest. But then you can start using like mechanical like solenoids or integrating mechanical solutions that will actually flip the switch for you. So maybe not exactly a robot, but it's pretty easy to send a signal to like a device that like pounds down and hits that switch for you. Makes sense. All right. And then um, this is a, a much higher speed for high, whoa, this is high frequency, high frequency from say one gigahertz to 40 gigahertz. Yes. How do you calibrate you? I mean, at that point, you've got to do some, you know, some, you, you really have to characterize the fixture itself, don't you? Yeah. So at that point, that's once again, kind of stepping out of where fixture fed likes to focus for with like what work that we decide to take on. But at that point, a lot of it comes down to like how you want to integrate that spectrum analyzer, or if it's more like the transmission and RF that you're worried about, you can actually buy like RF safe enclosures, like for really making sure that nothing is interfering with it. Um, I'm sure as you can imagine, the, a factory floor is a very noisy environment, especially when it comes to RF testing. So you can actually buy special boxes for your test fixtures that tries to protect it from that. But once again, you're probably going to be looking for a very specialized expert for designing those tests. Yeah, that that is very high frequency, Kim. Um, and you know, when you when you do the characterization, and you know, you do fixture dot fixture um, calibration, so that you're just looking at the the device under test. Um, I'm glad I don't have to do it. <laughs> <laughs> it's complicated. It, it's it's fascinating work, but yeah, it, it gets hard. Like, um, Jason, Jason Ellison of I think he's with Amphenol. Yeah, um, I could be wrong about who he's with, but Google Jason Ellison. I, I know he's exceedingly interested in that type of work. Um, and he's a great guy. Um, might be somebody who can, you know, act as a resource or shoot me an email and I'd be happy to do an introduction. Yeah, so. I, would, I would actually like that introduction for later. But yeah. Oh, sure, yeah. For a lot of times, like the basic testing that most boards actually only require for like basic Bluetooth and Wi-Fi testing, it's those Intel NUCs have that I was talking about earlier, they have Bluetooth and Wi-Fi modulars. It's pretty easy to program those and make sure it can contact the device once it's inside the fixture. You know, Joe, if you guys ever, um, I, I, I know you're incredibly busy, um, but if you ever have one of these old fixtures that you just aren't using anymore or, or, or whatever, um, I'd love to send that down to our, our Colorado facility and let our process engineers see what's involved in that and see if maybe we can create an, a, a value add for our customers. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I think I actually live pretty close to advanced assembly too. So Joe, come over. Well, yeah. we're all working from home again with Omicron. We, we were trying to last year when we gave this presentation, but COVID was a thing. So we pumped the brakes on that. But yeah, man, let's let's get that happening. Um, I, I think this could be an incredible value add for our customers. Yeah. All right. I do have some other questions I'm going to hold for now. Let's keep rolling. Yes. 
So I'm going to keep on going through the slides here and see what else we had on deck for this presentation. So here, we, I mentioned again earlier that test point list or that CSV. This is where you define basically what your test points are, what it's named, what net it's probing, the coordinates of it, if it's on the top or the bottom of the board. And then we're specifically interested in the hole or pad size and if it's like an SMD pad or a through hole. So this is what we'll ask for. Like we can do this ourselves, but honestly, the electrical engineer who designed the board is able to get this information the most effectively. So these are kind of like the data points that we're looking for for each test point. And we can take this and generate those um, models that we're showing later from that. Hey, I recognize those net names. Yeah, I think you might, yes. <laughs> Yeah. So, and then kind of the next step then, this is where we're getting more into that electrical design of this turnkey test system. So we'll, it's, it's all block diagrams, like what is connected to what. So here you have your device under test and you know how it's interfacing, but you need to know what to do with those nets that are on the board. So this is where now we're very familiar, once again, that acronym MTM system. So we know like what channels on like the USB stem or DAC2 how many like, digital and analog inputs and output we have. And then we know how to route those from these devices and how to use these devices with that Intel NUC and basically like how it all plugs into each other. Do you have enough like USB ports on your fixture? So kind of like the next step then is kind of standardizing your approach for how do you want to design the electrical integration to actually read the signals on your circuit board. Because then once you have this entire system, you plug into your Intel NUC, the computer in that fixture base. And that's when you start writing the software that does all your functional testing and programming of the board. Um, and here we go. We have some of our design for test guidelines. I'll send you the PDF afterwards with a more like concise list of this. But these are basically our minimum requirements or that we look for. So making sure your test points are 75 mils apart. Um, the biggest one is making sure that all your test points are on a single side of the board. That is the easiest way to make sure you have like a simple and a more affordable test fixture. Placing your test points and their distance to the other components is important to pay attention to just because if you're trying to cut a hole for that receptacle, but that hole diameter is running into like a component on the board, you're going to have some mechanical issues in placing that there. And then here you go, 0.8 millimeters is the diameter that we're looking for for our SMD test pads. But that is the minimum, right? You should design yeah. above that if possible. You want to be above this if possible. I mean, you can always go a little smaller, but it's you're going to be running into intermittent reliability issues just because of the tolerances of making sure that that 0.7 millimeter probe tip is actually contacting only the test pad itself. Yeah. And for reference, if you guys are even able to see this, most of the ones on here are one point, you know, probably about two and the other ones are 2.5 millimeters. They're huge in comparison. Yes. You never see them this big. Exactly. And if they're that big though, I mean, that fixture would work very well for this. We would not yeah. be concerned at all about locating the location for that and probing it. And then it also gives you more slop with alignment. It does. You know, if, you do, if you have a robot picking them up and putting them down and there's a little movement, it doesn't matter. Exactly. So I think that's everything that we had in our presentation. Uh, were you going to do a live view as well of your software or would you? Um, I don't think we're going to do, I would rather do the live view of our software and the one that we're going to record. Okay, perfect. Um, and again, I, I don't mean to ask you to do that again, but I want to make sure we're putting your best foot forward um, because this is really, really cool content. Really cool. Yeah, we're excited so, about it too. Oh yeah, no, I, and I'm I'm really sorry that we were mean to Duncan and he ran away. That, oh no, that's okay. Pulling the audible and being able to present too, it's we're good enough at it. So you guys are, you guys are. We, great. we got the point across, I believe. All right, so we're taking all the questions that you have right now. If you have more, please ask them in the Q and A, um, and then we'll just go through them with my friend Joe. Back to pressure plate mechanical. What about? The double-sided component placements. How do you relieve pressure for the components? That is a good question too. Let me see. I think I had a picture in here that can show this well. So right here we go. So right here at the top of this, you have your device under test and you kind of see, you have some components that are sticking up on top. 
So this board was simple. There were no components at the bottom of the board. However, that's not always the case. And it's, it's very fairly common to have components at the bottom too. In that point, you just want to add a cutout to that moving plate so you can still set that PCB flush against it. So if there's like a tall component or even just a handful of resistors, um, you can just provide a cutout in that moving plate so it's, it fits so the, um, the components don't interfere with it. That's actually a feature that we want to add to our design platform that we've been working on, but detecting those components is slightly challenging when we're trying to automate it. Fair enough. And for those of you that don't know, they do have um, an online web-based fixture designer that's really cool. And we will demonstrate that in the replay of this. So you get to watch this twice. I'm excited for you guys. All right, next question. Um, this is from the same user that asked about the one gigahertz to 40 gigahertz. Yes. Would a probe station be an advantage by incorporating it into the fixture? A probe station. I'm not sure if I, so a little bit of my, of my background, I'm a software engineer who works on a lot of the automation of our software. But so as far as like a probe station, I, I think you're talking about maybe like specific like instrumentation required to test like higher frequency signals. Yeah, I, I don't really know what the question is either, Kimberly. Maybe you could clarify. Are you talking about like an RF, you know, something that that's going to connect um, like an SMA or uh, uh, you probably wouldn't use SMA. Yeah, um, you want to make sure you're selecting like the right instrumentation to like read the um, RF signals. And then kind of the next concern that I'm aware of is that you want to make sure it's placed so that transmission line is as short as possible. So absolutely. Um, but Kimberly, once we get Duncan back, I think he would be better equipped to answer those questions for you. Or if you want to clarify, um, you know, maybe Joe and I don't understand exactly what you were asking. Okay, here's a fun one. You're going to like this. How do you guys test piezos and buzzers? Uh, yeah, so buzzers, um, you can select uh, instrumentation that basically listens for the audio frequency and ideally has a way that you can interface with that device so you can read the signals that it's detecting. And that comes down, like you have to select the sensor that you want to use to detect the frequencies from the buzzer. And then making sure that you have a way to read what that device is detecting. And honestly, we would probably just go to SparkFun or Amazon or DigiKey and search for like audio sensor and see like what their interfacing solutions are. Interesting. And um, then you get the device drivers from them, you know, Adafruit or SparkFun. Fun. You don't have to write the code, just incorporate it. I like yeah. it. Yeah, it's, it's fairly common for us, especially for our full turnkey systems um, that we'll usually have to like learn how to use a new toy that will stick inside of our fixtures. And once again, too, also, if it's just an audio frequency, you can always try um, analyzing the signal that's going to that device, too. Oh, that's true. Just put an uh, AD converter on it. and Yeah, but then it comes down to the question, like, do you care about the pitch and the specific harmonics of the buzzer? Or do you just want to make sure that it's getting a signal that's going and assume that the buzzer is going to work the right way? That kind of comes down to the cost benefit of analysis. So like how important is this test for this board? Yeah, and exactly what it is that you are testing. If harmonics matter, it becomes, you know, then you've got to do FFT and all that other fun stuff. Yes. And these are very common questions we'll work through too when like defining a test specification. So a lot of times like a customer will think I need to be like very like specific about how I want to test this. But a lot of times like, hey, like 99% of the time, it's just good enough to make sure that the signal is getting into the device. And if you trust the tolerances of what you put on your board in the bottom, then maybe it's good enough to just like assume that those devices are going to work if they get the right signals. Very cool. Okay. Is there a difference in preference or reliability between through hole versus SMD test point surface mount versus tab, you know, grabbing say like, uh, you know, I've got pins here on the backside of the switch for RGB LEDs. Let's say I want to use those as my test points. Is the difference between that and, um, you know, SMD surface mount pad? Um, really? No, I would say we probably slightly prefer through holes just because they're typically a larger size than like SMD test pads could be. And then mechanically, if it's a spear tip going to the through hole, that's going to be secure every time when it goes into that through hole. There's not much on either end of that to interfere with. 
where maybe if it was a pad, like a spear tip might bounce off of it a little bit, but they're, as long as that pad is the right size and spaced correctly, they're basically the same reliability to probe. One advantage of through holes though, is that you can probe them from both the top and bottom layers. So every once in a while we'll run into that if there's a pad and it's on the bottom layer and this is a top side probe uh, device, then we had to add dual sided probing. But if all your test points are through holes, you can probe those from both the top and bottom. All right, very cool. All right, so Kimberly an answers back, a probe station is very precise in getting the signal interfaces into and out of the test points. Um, thank, you for, thank you for sharing that. Um, it doesn't change my comfort level with answering your question with any authority. I just, I don't know. How about yeah. you, Joe? At that point, we're going to want to get the person who designed the board in the conversation, have a very specific conversation around like what they're trying to test and how they want to do this. Um, because RF testing, RF is hard. RF testing is also hard is kind of the answer to that. Yeah. Okay. Uh, any other questions, please ask them now. We've got uh, a few more coming in here in a, a few more minutes, I hope. Uh, can we steal a little bit more of your time, Joe? Sure. All right. Um, if the test point cables were to be connected to an external fixture relative to the probe station, uh, this might become a more automatic manner of measurement. So instead of, I, let, let, let's just try this. Instead of using just the spring-loaded pogo pins, can you integrate other connectors into this process? You can. Um, the preferred solution is always going to be a dedicated test point because the, we know where those are and we know how to probe those reliably. But every once in a while, like it would be possible to like probe these um, pins up here on top with like a cup tip probe. But that's going to get a little, it's you're adding complexities to the mechanical design at that point. And if it's a big enough connector and a simple enough one, you can line up connectors that will actually be pushed down upon it when it's being compressed in the fixture. Once again, it's more reliable to use an actual test point for that. And then another solution is if you're testing low volumes, sometimes the answer is just manually plug in like a complicated like 100 pin ribbon connector and then load the device into the fixture. And these are all like considerations we'll take into account when we're designing um, um, some of our production fixtures. That's true. So if you have something where um, you're, you're just not able to do it economically, I mean, you can do anything if you pay enough money for it, right? Yeah, um, kind of come what the answer comes down to. Yeah, but if you can do half automated, half manual, you know, so somebody picks up a board, they plug in a, an RF connector, uh, you know, maybe some edge launch, even an SMA, it would take five seconds, but 60 seconds for the test. I wouldn't say do that um, because I don't know what I'm talking about. I'm just saying it could be done. Um, yeah. And I'm pretty sure SMA is the exact wrong answer. Uh, I just can't think of the, the name of the other connector that I have visualized right now, yeah. um, but it's sure not an SMA. Yeah. And so we do our best to automate as much as we can. Everyone's like, we had a situation a few months ago where a customer had a horizontal connector that needed to be interfaced with, um, but they did not have the budget to have a horizontally actuated connector, which they do exist. You can load a device under test and like align it. So basically horizontally, the connector comes in and plugs in with it uh, at a different orientation, but that's a more expensive solution. But then they realized their volumes were low enough that their operator takes them a second to plug in the cable uh, manually and load it into the fixture. So not right. ideal, but if it saves several thousands to tens of thousands of dollars in a solution, maybe that's more beneficial to you. Yeah, very true. Man, this is so cool. Um, I sure wish we didn't have COVID and I could come, you know, come see this stuff. Mm -hmm. um, but that being said, once we get past this next wave, and before the wave after that, um, let's get you into to advanced assembly and see see what we do there. And uh, I, do you have any of these devices kicking around? I have a few um, where I live in Denver, yes. Um, and then we also have a workshop at, in Seattle now too. So I was just thinking in Denver, um, and you don't have to leave it, just bring it with you and show our process engineers, right? Of course. Um, it doesn't even necessarily have to work, but it would be nice if it did. <laughs> you know, but if you don't have the boards for it, you don't have the boards for it. Um, but I really would like to um, 
for you guys to, to get a chance to talk and see if this isn't a value add for our customers, because, you know, we make boards, we populate them, we do the x-ray testing and all that fancy stuff. And x-ray is phenomenal. I love it. But functional testing is totally, totally useful. Um, I, I really like to see it. So. Yeah, we'd love to demonstrate it too. All right. So for everybody out there in TV land, we appreciate you staying with us through the loss of Duncan. I know it's been hard on everybody, but we're going to soldier through. And um, what we're going to do is figure out a time that Joe and Duncan can join me again in the very near future, hopefully within a week. And we will re-record Duncan's part. Uh, Don't worry. We'll be sure to shame him for his failures in Wi-Fi connectivity. But uh, we're going to get it all squared away and we're going to make a beautiful recording available to you in the very near future. You can find it at AAPCB forward slash blog or at the Advanced Assembly YouTube channel. Uh, Just Google Advanced Assembly. You'll find us. Uh, Other than that, it has really been a pleasure. I always love having you guys on. It's great content. And um, I really love what you're doing. I hope you continue to keep keep developing, keep hiring, keep growing. And uh, make sure you hire me before you go public, though, okay? I want in on that. Good to know. We appreciate the interest, Mark. Thank you. And I'll, yeah, we should definitely talk about visiting Advanced Assembly at some point. Absolutely. Hey, um, would you like people to email you? Do you have an outro card or anything? You can email us at hello at fixturefab.com. Hello at fixturefab.com. Okay. Yes, most permutations of fixture fab and the spelling should work and get rerouted to the right one. But <laughs> fixture, fixture without an E, but if you want to use an E, then we'll get to us too. Okay. Well, that's great. Well, thank you so much for taking the time, Joe. And Duncan, if you're out there, man, we miss you. Come back to us. We'll be nicer next time. I promise. (laughs) So that's it. That's it for uh, this presentation. We we're going to be taking the next couple of weeks off for the holiday. Uh, So our next webinar is going to be in January sometime, but we really appreciate all of you spending an hour with us today. I hope you found it valuable. I'm Mark. That's Joe. And we'll see you next time.